Thank you for joining us for another great service at First NLR. I'm honored that you have set aside part of your week to be with us. If you enjoy watching the service, you'll love it even more in person. We would love for you to come and spend a weekend in a service with us and introduce yourself in the guest center. You can learn more about service times and other ways to connect at firstnlr.com. I'm praying that today's message speaks to you and I'm believing for God to do marvelous things in your life. Thanks for watching. I was going to preach this message the week before Easter, but that weekend I needed to address the storms and the resulting fear and uncertainty, so this message got skipped. We talked about it as a team. This is an important topic for many, and we didn't want to skip it, but telling it now would be telling the story out of sequence. And finally, we decided everyone loves a good prequel. The way it works for Star Wars, it'll work for us. So the setting for this story is just, it begins at the last moment of the Last Supper. It was a difficult, painful night for Jesus as he revealed that Judas would betray him. One of the most painful things you can experience is betrayal. When someone you love turns their back on you, the pain is deep. When someone you've invested in, taught, trained, and mentored walks away, blames you for their problems, it's absolutely heartbreaking. When a close friend or follower publicly criticizes you and people believe them, that's devastating. When a leader you trusted and followed lies and deceives and you take the blame for their mistakes, that hurts beyond words. When someone you regarded as family lashes out on social media, it's difficult to understand. You try to do the right thing. If you're spiritually mature, you don't fight back. You don't try to make sure everyone gets your side of the story. But you wonder, why me? After everything I did for them, how could they do this to me? Jesus knows how you feel. He suffered a horrible, devastating public Betrayal. It's one of the saddest stories in the entire Bible. Jesus invested in his closest followers. He mentored, trained, taught, empowered, and prepared them to share his story everywhere and be representatives in a fallen world. But in spite of everything Jesus taught, the disciples let him down in an historic, horrible way. More than 2,000 years later, it's still a painful story. Now, you might be on the other side of it. You might feel like you've let Jesus down. You knew what was right. You knew what to do, but you didn't do it. You failed. You had an affair, wrecked your marriage and family. You failed, lost your reputation and ministry. Your certain people will never forget what you did. You're haunted by your mistakes, convinced there's no way God has a plan for you. You might doubt God could still love you, that you can even make it to heaven after your epic failure. If that's you, I want you to listen very closely to this story of failure and betrayal. And if you've been betrayed, if people you thought loved you instead let you down and failed you, there's a powerful lesson in this story for you. We pick it up in Matthew 28, end of the Last Supper, when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. At the time of Passover, thousands of people came to Jerusalem. The population swelled from 50,000 to as many as 200,000. It was like Branson at Christmas. There were traffics and crowds everywhere. Thousands were camped out on the Mount of Olives and the hillsides surrounding the city. So the disciples went with Jesus to a quiet place in the hills, away from the crowds. These were their last few moments before Jesus' death. Jesus told them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all, all these other dudes fall away on account of you, I never will. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, in other words, before morning, 
you'll disown me three times. And Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. Peter was first, but they all said it. Jesus, I'll never leave you. I will never deny you. If it costs my life, I'll follow you. Others might fail, not me. I will die before I let you down. Ride or die, true to the end. They all said it. Jesus uh, went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. This so might be better translated sorrowful and anxious. Jesus understands anxiety, apprehension, and fear. Jesus understands what you experience and what you feel because he's been there. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus knew what was coming. He wanted to spend his last few moments praying with his closest followers. Going a little further, he fell down with his face to the ground. And the Son of God, the Savior of the world, on his knees, with his face on the ground, prayed, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus wasn't a superhero. When he left heaven and came to earth, he came as a man. He felt troubled and anxious. He experienced physical pain. Jesus knew the path was going to be difficult. And then the next few hours would be filled with hurt and pain. And so he prayed, God, if there's another way to accomplish your plan, please do that instead. Even though I'm not looking forward to what's ahead of me, I trust you. It's your will and your plan, not mine. And I will obey. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? Watch, pray so you won't fall into temptation. The spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. Jesus taught, led, and cared for his disciples. They saw miracles, they endured opposition. They shared, shared virtually every moment for three years. Now Jesus asked them to pray with him in his most difficult hour as he faced persecution and death. Remember, the disciples knew what was coming. They knew the desperation of the moment. You'd think that they'd be as anxious or more anxious than Jesus, and they failed. In Jesus' most desperate hour, his best friends and closest followers fell asleep. They couldn't stay awake for one hour to pray for their mentor and leader, Jesus, the Son of God. Now, I'd like to think, if I said to you this morning, hey, um, this is it for me. When church is done, I'm going to be arrested and then killed for my faith. This is our last hour together. We just have a short time left. You can't stop it. I just, all I ask for you is one thing. We spent all this time together. I love you. I just want one thing. Would you pray with me? I'd like to think you could stay awake and pray. I can't imagine the disappointment Jesus felt. Sleep mattered more. I wondered if they'd stayed with him watching and praying, if they'd been able to stay strong and not abandon him. We'll never know because sleep mattered more. Jesus told them, stay awake and pray. Second chance. This time, stay awake. Now, if I was a disciple, I would have done whatever it took to stay awake and pray. I would have walked around. I would have chewed ice. Uh, I would have gone down to the Jerusalem come and go and got a, you know, a six-pack of Red Bull. I'd have done something because it was six-pack of Red Bull. You'd be... <laughs> I don't drink caffeine. If I had half a can of Red Bull, I'd be just tripping. And <laughs> But wouldn't you do whatever it took? To pray with Jesus? 
Jesus went away a second time. He prayed, Father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. He prayed the same prayer. He was agonizing over what was next. I understand a little, not a lot, because I'll pray, God, I know what you told me to do. I know what you've told me to say, but God, this isn't gonna go well. People aren't gonna receive this. I'm gonna get angry emails. People are gonna leave the church. Um, God, if, if there's another way or another plan, if we could work this out another way, it'd be all right with me, but I'll obey. But this isn't gonna be easy. It's the way Jesus prayed. When he came back, he found them sleeping again because, oh, poor disciples, their eyes were heavy. I'm so sorry that your eyes are heavy. Sleep mattered more. The disciples didn't offer any excuse. They didn't know what to say. They were speechless at having left Jesus again. So he left them, went away once more, prayed the third time. Same thing. Same prayer. Father, if there's another way, release me from this. But I trust you. It's not what I want, but it's your will and I'll follow your plan. I will pay the price no matter how difficult. Then he returned to the disciples and he said to them, really, are you still sleeping and resting? Unbelievable. Not once, not twice, three times. They fell asleep instead of praying. Even knowing Jesus' reaction, they made the same mistake again. They were repeat offenders. Jesus said, look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered to the hand of sinners. Rise, get up, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus actually had to wake up the disciples so they would go, go with him to be arrested. This is like if I asked you for prayer because I was going to be arrested when church was over and all of you fell asleep. And when it was time for them to come arrest me, I'd say, hello, wake up. They're coming to arrest me now. Let's all go. Unbelievable. Well, he was still speaking. Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. The traditional Middle Eastern greeting, both cheeks. We found out later, Judas's payoff for betraying Jesus was 30 pieces of silver, about a half year's wage. Big amount, not a life-changing amount. Be about $15,000 today. Judas abandoned Jesus, the son of God, so he could have more stuff for the short term. What a tragic trade. Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, from John's telling the story, we know the servant's name was Malchus, and the disciple, no surprise, who cut off his ear was Peter. <laughs> Jesus taught peace. Jesus taught loving your enemies. Jesus taught turning the other cheek and going the second mile. But for some reason, Peter brought a sword to a prayer meeting. <laughs> Peter's big plan, a whole angry mob is there. They're coming to arrest Jesus. Peter, ride or die, I'm with you forever. His big plan was to cut off one guy's ear. Now the Bible doesn't give a lot of details. It kind of minimizes this part of the story, and I'd like to know more. Peter cut his ear off. It was a bloody, gory mess. Malchus was screaming, looking at his ear on the ground. People were yelling. Luke's version tells what happens next. Jesus answered, no more of this, stop it. He touched the man's ear and healed him. Now put your sword back in its place, he told Peter, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And can we just pause there? Because I'd like a few more details. I want to know what Jesus said to Malchus. 
when Peter cut his ear off, hey man, I am so sorry about your ear. This, this doesn't look good. Ooh, sorry, let me speak on this side so you can hear me better. <laughs> and I am so sorry about my disciple. I, I've been working with Peter for three years and we've been working on that anger thing and I thought we were making progress. He hasn't been throwing temper fits and look, that was so unfortunate. Hold on a second. <laughs> Here, let me put your ear back. Can you imagine the conversation when Malchus got home for dinner? <laughs> Let's just imagine this is this for those of you who are new to church, this is called extra biblical. Okay? So it's not in the Bible, but it could be and it should be. All right. <laughs> Mrs. Malchus said, How was your day? Well, <laughs> it's kind of different, and I'm not sure you're going to believe this, but here's the story. We went to arrest Jesus, and when we did, one of his guys cut my ear off, this one. <laughs> and then the strangest thing happened. The guy we went to arrest and kill, he picked my ear up off the ground, it was all covered in blood. I was screaming. And he, he put it back. <laughs> Look, see, it's, it's there. Go ahead. Ooh, I can hear that. Isn't that awesome? It's attached. <coughs> and she looked at him and said, well, if you're not going to tell me what happened, fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was a remarkable moment. It gives insight how we're supposed to treat our enemies. Jesus called Judas friend. And Jesus healed the ear of a guy who'd come to arrest and kill him. Jesus lived out his teaching about love and forgiveness. People share their story of betrayal and hurt and they ask, how can you tell me to forgive? Can God really expect me to forgive? Refusal to forgive gives your offender control over you. Your hatred, your desire to see them hurt and your prayer that they will rot in hell doesn't hurt them. It hurts and destroys you. Consider the example of Jesus with Judas and Malchus. That's how you're supposed to treat people who hurt and betray you. With love and kindness and forgiveness. It's not easy but it's necessary. And for some of you, this, this one thing is the key to freedom. Hurt long held turns into hatred. It consumes and destroys you, keeps you awake at night. I want you to imagine the moment the mob was arresting Jesus. Why? For claiming he's the son of God. And then he put a guy's ear back on. Now, if you were in the mob, wouldn't that tend to convince you he might be the son of God? Jesus said, Peter, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword die by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call on my father and he'll put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled? to say it must happen in this way. He said, come on, Peter, don't you know, I don't need your pitiful help with the sword. I could escape this. We don't know how many a legion of angels is. Scholars disagree. I tend to go with a legion was about 6,000. He said 12 legions. So he's like, I could call 70, 75,000. I could call an army of angels to wipe these guys out. I don't have to pay this price. I'm willing to pay this price. It's worth it. It must happen this way. Jesus knew what was going to happen and why it had to happen. Jesus said to the crowd, come on, am I leading a rebellion that you have to come with swords and clubs to capture me every day? I sit in the temple courts teaching and you don't arrest me. This has taken place that the writings of the prophets 
might be fulfilled. Even in Jesus' most tense pressure back moment, he was reminding the crowd, this is another proof I'm the Son of God. And the next line is surprising. It's sad. It's an unexpected ending. It's a tragic part of the story. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. What? Didn't they just tell Jesus, we're with you, we're by your side is the end, ride or die, never turn our backs on you? The original readers of the story knew this was a big deal. Betrayal was huge in a culture built on relationship. The disciples and Jesus broke bread and ate together a few hours before. Now all the disciples ran away and betrayed Jesus. No one was left, not one. You've heard sermons and stories about Peter's betrayal, but he wasn't the only one who denied Jesus. They all left. They all ran rather than stay with Jesus. When times were tough and the chips were down, they couldn't pray with him and they wouldn't stay with him. Instead, they took off running in a frantic attempt to get as far from Jesus as they could. Can you imagine the deep, heavy disappointment Jesus faced in his final hours? Jesus was betrayed by Judas, one of his closest followers. Jesus' best friends couldn't even stay awake to pray with him. Jesus was abandoned by all his disciples. In the most difficult moment of his life, they left him alone. What a night. Talk about letting down Jesus. These guys win the award. And what you expect to come next is Jesus watched them run away and he shouted after them, you pathetic losers. Forget everything I said. Forget my promises. That authority I gave you, I'm taking it back. There will be somebody else who takes your place who's not a pathetic quitter. I may forgive, but I will never forget. I am done with you. You're strangers to me. Don't ever expect to be part of my plan. You're out of my life and out of the kingdom forever. That's what you expect. But I want to jump ahead after Jesus was crucified, after he rose again, and take you to the surprise ending of the story. If you feel like you've let God down, that he could never forgive you, never love you, never let you into heaven, never have a plan for you, this part of the story will absolutely change your perspective. This is stunning. John chapter 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, so first they ran, now they hide. Jesus came and stood among them and said, morons. That's not what he said. <laughs> Jesus said, peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. He was showing him his wounds to prove it was him. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then this is crazy. This is unbelievable what Jesus said next. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Now, wait a second. What about them betraying you? What about them falling asleep instead of praying? What about them running away in your worst moment? What about the lie will always be with you? Nothing will ever cause us to leave you. What about all that? Didn't the disciples deserve to be punished? At the very least, get a really stern lecture. It didn't happen. Instead, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I send you. Jesus said, you are my representatives in this fallen world, and I still have a plan for you. Now let's fast forward one more time. Acts chapter 1, right before Jesus left for the final time to return to heaven, Jesus' last words to his disciples were not, thanks a lot for abandoning you, abandoning me. I've forgiven you, but you're out of the plan. He said, look what Jesus said. This is another crazy moment. Same guys who ran and hid. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, 
and to all the ends of the earth. I still have a plan for you. You're gonna receive a new dimension of power. You're gonna take my message all over the world, near and far. You are the guys who are going to start my church. In spite of all their failures, Jesus still had a plan for them. It was unbelievable how they let down Jesus. It's even more remarkable that he still used them in powerful ways. Maybe you feel like you've let Jesus down. You disobeyed, you sinned, you walked away, you failed. He'll still use you. In spite of your mistakes and failures, even if you're a repeat offender, God still has a plan for your life. You're still kingdom qualified. You can still fulfill his purpose. He loves you. He's ready to forgive you. He wants to use you. The issue is not, will he forgive you? The issue is, will you forgive you? He already has. You just have to decide whether you'll accept that. It's the beautiful side of a super sad story. Jesus didn't give up on his disciples and Jesus won't give up on you. He's faithful. Maybe you're on the other side of it and you felt the sting of betrayal. Jesus knows what you feel and it's time to follow his example because when you forgive, you're free. What an incredible service. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our church family. If you have any questions about today's service, if you need prayer, or if you just want to learn more about First NLR, go to firstnlr.com or follow us on social media at First NLR. Our goal is for you to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. And I pray that the Lord would bless and guide you as you obediently follow what he has for you and your family. We look forward to connecting with you. I've got a whole bunch of grown-ups. They're like family. They're always happy to see me, and they tell me I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am strong, courageous, mighty. They say God has a plan for me, and it's good. They're not babysitting over here. What? I ain't no baby. They give me the chance to serve in ministry and develop the gifts God gave me. I get to worship and pray, and I'm making a lot of friends, too. My leaders know that following Jesus as a family is important. So every weekend in the backyard preschool, high voltage kids ministry, and even in big church, we're all learning the same thing. Sometimes I like to quiz my parents to make sure they got it. Every time I'm with them, these grown-ups make sure I know I matter because every soul matters to God.